Hello, BookTube. Well, we did it. We reached the very last bookcase, uh, bookshelf of the corner bookcase. This is bookshelf number five of the corner bookcase. It's all the way down at the bottom, so it has no transverse books. I didn't want to double stack anything. I want to be able to just glance at it and see what I had. Uh, so we'll start with uh, this first one, which is something you will recognize. <laughs> Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. Her fantastic uh, Tudor historical novel that I just cannot praise highly enough, and that I praised first uh, before any other critic. I read the long excerpt that she published uh, and was blown away, and I, I wrote at the time that that excerpt came out, I think in the London Review of Books or the New York Review of Books, I wrote at the time that if the whole novel is as good as this excerpt, it will be the best Tudor historical novel ever written. And in my opinion, it is. Uh, and it's right next to, on the shelf, it's right next to the sequel, Bring Up the Bodies, which... Uh, I really liked as well as they read really as one piece. Uh, and now all the literary world just waits for the third one, the conclusion in the trilogy. Uh, uh, I can't, can't wait. Hope uh, that it's fantastic. I feel certain that it will be. And then we have uh, these little trade paperbacks of uh, the old Sidney Paget illustrated Sherlock Holmes that you will remember that I have. Uh, let's see, here you go. Got the illustrations. I have uh, the hardcover illustrated Sherlock Holmes, so I, I don't know why I keep these. <laughs> I, uh, I guess sometimes you, you're in the mood for just a little Holmes instead of a lot. I'm, I'm not really sure. <laughs> uh, then we have uh, the same series, The Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, which I, I just love. There, there's Sir Henry Baskerville arriving home at Baskerville Hall. <laughs> uh, I just love Hound of the Baskervilles. It's a, it, it can do no wrong for me. <laughs> Uh, then we have uh, uh, The World Without Us by Alan Wiseman, in which, as you can see from the excellent cover design, he uh, hypothesizes what the world would be like if humans were to vanish in an instant. What would happen to the world? How and in what ways would it recover? What would be the first things to happen? What would be the tenth things to happen? What would it be like in a hundred years? And this book uh, was ripped off for a TV series. It was adapted for a TV series. It was... Uh, he wrote a sequel. It, it sparked a whole bunch of thinking. Uh, and this first one, I think, is still unbeatable. I loved it. Just loved it. I thought that the author was, uh, in, in some places, a little misleadingly optimistic, especially when it comes to uh, uh, nuclear reactors, which humans have dotted all over the planet and all over the ocean on vessels that would suddenly have no human crews. And a uh, great many of those nuclear reactors require humans to keep them from exploding. And <laughs> so there's a very strong argument to be made that the world without us would only be a living world for about a year, and that after that it would be a radioactive wasteland. He doesn't really believe that, so he uh, he sort of lets his hypotheticals go on without that. Uh, I could I could have asked for a chapter in which he takes a hard look at Chernobyl, which, you know, 99.9% .9 of the world thinks is a done subject, but Chernobyl is not a done subject. Chernobyl is a bomb ready to go off. It's not, if it's not carefully, carefully handled every day for the next million years, it could wipe out all life in Europe easily. <laughs> and that sort of thing isn't given enough weight in this, but the book is still fantastic. Just an incredible examination of it. It will make you think. Uh, then we have the Oxford Book of Ghost Stories, uh, which I just love. This is my I, one of my favorite ghost story anthologies. Uh, the Oxford Book of series, they always do great work. Uh, and I love uh, ghost stories when they're done really well. I just love them. <laughs> uh, even though <laughs> there's no such thing as ghosts. <laughs> uh, and then we have something I think I've mentioned on this channel a couple of times before. This is Patriots. Uh, by A.J. Languth. This is his this is his narrative history of the American Revolution. And uh, it comes up often in book discussions that I have with people because people will often ask me, where do I start? They'll pick a subject and they'll say, where do I start? Give me a book on subject X, Y, or Z that is really good but not really intimidating. And this is always the one I picked for the American Revolution, which is a American Revolution is a popular request I get along those lines. Uh, because it, it reads like a novel. It just rips along. So, I, <laughs> in that context, I highly recommend it right now. Uh, then we have, uh, this is uh, Henry David Thoreau's Cape Cod, uh, with an, the 
this, it just his, you know, century-old study of walking around on Cape Cod. And the reason I have this edition as opposed to any other is <laughs> something that will be familiar to you. It has illustrations by Henry Bugby Kane, whose, whose illustrations I think are just wonderful. He does uh, spot illustrations and full black and white illustrations uh, throughout the book, and they're, they're just amazing. I figure if you like Thoreau's Cape Cod anyway, then why not you know, wait around at the battle for the edition that you really want. <laughs> that was my thinking on the subject. Uh, then we have uh, The Twelve Caesars by Michael Grant, uh, in which he takes Suetonius, the, the classic work, The Twelve Caesars, and gives it a uh, modern update. He does write Suetonius as Suetonius would, would write his own book if he had access to modern archaeology and modern historiography. Uh, Ordinarily, that sort of thing would really dust my doilies, but uh, in this case, Grant is such an affable writer, and that the, his book actually is a wonderful counterpoint to Suetonius, who, of course, wasn't writing serious history in the way that we understand it today. So you can't really go to his work for that, uh, but you still want to go to it, because he had access to documents that are long since gone for us, and he had, had actually seen and met the people he was writing about, a lot of them. Uh, so... Uh, this works as an excellent counterpoint to that. I've had many people over the years, over the decades, uh, hear me praise Suetonius. I love his work. And, and say, yeah, but is it reliable? It's not modern history. I, wh I want to know what I can believe and not believe. Uh, and there are two approaches to that. You, can, you should do both, actually. You should get yourself a Suetonius that has really good notes, the Oxford or the Penguin. And you should also get this, so that you can just read it as a separate book. Uh, then we have... Uh, a poetry book called Diminutive Revolutions by Daniel Bouchard. It's a, I, I guess, I guess sheer demographic fairness suggests that I should have a slim volume of poetry here in my room. <laughs> uh, then we have uh, uh, Harry May's The Tragedy of Erasmus with an amateurish cover, uh, which is a, it's a, <laughs> it's a little bit hard to explain. It's a, it's not. It's a criticism of Erasmus. It's a book-length criticism of some of the thought and prejudices of Erasmus. And because I am the, the man's number one fan, I have to have the book. I'm not really sure what it's doing in this room. It, it, it probably shouldn't be in here. It, it's worth keeping, but uh, and worth consulting over and over again. It's a it's a thought-provoking book. If you know Erasmus, it's a thought-provoking book. And then the last one we have on the last bookshelf of the corner bookshelf is this. It's the old Barnes & Noble classic edition of Vanity Fair by William Makepeace Thackeray. And it has the, the deckel edges, and it's full of the original illustrations. It's one of the best hardcover reprints that uh, Barnes & Noble ever did. It also has this lovely cover. Uh, so I couldn't resist. I'm a big fan of, of uh, Vanity Fair. And this is the best edition that I know of. And it just happens to be a Barnes & Noble house reprint. That's the way the cookie grumbles sometimes. <laughs> so there you have it. That is, that is the final bookcase, or the final bookshelf of the corner bookcase. Uh, I will leave annotations to all these things down below. And from here we will move on <laughs> to other bookcases in the room. Uh, uh, and in the rest of the house and the rest of here at Hyde Cottage. Uh, but we're done with this one. We did the, the one that I think is probably the most difficult to film. Uh, and that's now done, and it was fairly painless. <laughs> so I'll see you soon, book two. Thank you.